In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer fitness and health questions asked by our audience. We do our best. But we also cover current events, talk about our lives, have a lot of fun. That's the intro portion of this episode. It lasts about 42 minutes. So here's what we talked about in this whole episode of Mind Pump. We start out by talking about single parents. Kudos to you. Oh, we man. are all not single parents. We know how tough it is. I can't even imagine what you guys must go through. So you guys are the champions. Yes. Then we talked about celebrities and politics. We just wish celebrities would shut up yeah. and act. That's all you should do. It's not hard. Then I talked about the focus that you need to have in between your sets. So when you're working out, oftentimes we focus on the exercise while we're doing it. In between, we tend to lose our focus. I think that makes a big difference. Then we talk about our YouTube channel, Mind Pump TV. Look, if you have any questions on exercises, exercise technique, you want to watch and see what it looks mm. like to do an exercise properly. Give it a gander. Go to YouTube, Mind Pump TV. We have uh, hundreds of videos there. Then I talked about the latest wellness influencer trend, not drinking water. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't follow their advice. Water is essential to be alive. So smart. Justin brought out Pixar, Pixar and their new movie coming out called Soul. I talked about the mysterious space signal that's hitting Earth every 16 days on the dot. Dude, they're coming. Aliens. Justin gave us a little update on his improv classes. I talked about tension versus weight. What is more important, the weight on the bar or the tension you feel in your muscles? And then we mentioned got tense. March 21st and 22nd, we have a NCI coaching specialist certification happening here at Mind Pump headquarters. Uh, oh, by the way... We have a hookup for you. If you go to their website, ncicertifications.com forward slash mind pump, you can get a free thyroid masterclass. That's a $600 course for free only for mind pump listeners. Plus 10 winners will receive $500 in gift cards for more certification classes through NCI. You, The winners will be notified by text, so make sure you enter the correct phone number when you register. Then we got into the fitness questions. The first question, this person wants to know, what's the best way to retain muscle mass while getting leader, leaner? So we talk about strategies for that. The next question, this person says, hey, look, powerlifting, what, is it good for aesthetics? Like we know powerlifting is great for getting really strong. How does it affect the way I look? The next question, this person says, what are the, next, what are the top excuse me, five things that Americans can do to improve their long-term health? So we list our top things that people can do, simple things that will have massive impacts Put down on the health. Uh, and the last question, uh, this person says, what are the positives and negatives of being a trainer? If you're thinking about being a personal trainer, you'll definitely don't want to miss that part of the episode. Also, all month long, MAPS Split, this is our bodybuilding, body sculpting, body shaping program. It's six days a week in the gym. It's hardcore and advanced. So if you've been working out for a while, you want to take your body to the next level. If you're super serious about training, if you love working out, you want to see what your body can do, Map Split, excellent program. It's 50% off. We cut the price in half only for February. Here's how you get that massive, massive discount. Go to mapsplit.com. That's M A P S S P L I T.com and use the code SPLIT50. That's S P L I T 50, no space for the discount. You guys get some weird DMs sometimes, right? Uh, is that like a rhetorical <laughs> question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And by weird, what do you mean? Yeah, like how weird? Like now, do you guys? Uh, it varies. Do you guys have a, a a weird DM that is common? You know, like someone will say something. I feel like you're setting us up for a trap. I know. Right? Well, right? I just don't like, want. I, I want. I don't want to give anything I, away yet. Okay, because yeah. I don't want to be the only one. Okay, so <laughs> yeah, you're trying, you're trying yeah. to get us to yeah, I know. give you uh, material. I yeah. get. It, this is weird because I know I have a, a, a Kermity quality to my voice. I know you guys make fun of me all the time for it, and I know it's uh, loud we and, we're and, assholes. and piercing. Yeah. But I get uh, DMs, and that's all they say. I love your voice. Uh, what? Really? What? Yeah. That's weird. Yeah, it's kind of weird fetishy. Yeah. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little... <laughs> it's, yeah. it's creepy-ish. It is. Mm. Yeah. Yesterday... I get that sometimes. So I had something I wanted to... You get to, the creepy-ish a little? I yeah. had something that I wanted to talk Definitely. to you guys about. Uh and I had this moment yesterday, and it just kind of dawned on me. And I this like, magic moment. Kind of, not really like that. I don't know the rest of the right. 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 I tried to set you up, Justin. You made me well, sound stupid. Well, so close to first, mine. First of all, and I, I don't know if I brought this up on the podcast before, but um, I really believe 
maybe the most important humans on this earth or the most uh, impressive are single mothers. Oh, single oh parents God. are or yeah, I should champion. say I should say single parents because being a single, yeah. I could. Most what of them are can moms. we do to help? Yeah, right. Let's be honest, so, uh, it's it's insane yeah. what the, what they what they do. Oh, it's, and most of them are moms. Well, so we it's, we it's have. Accurate. I mean, we have a we have a tremendous amount of support. Like we we have a nanny. We have uh, her family that's close by. She's got cousins and uncles and aunts and her uh, grandparents. Like, and mine even too. That my sister comes every single month. Like we have tons of support. So I'm extremely blessed to be in the situation that we're in. And Katrina does an incredible job of carrying the rest of the load that, and t- so I can work and do what I do. And I see how exhausted she is. So like a lot of times we'll lay there and I'll look at her and I'm just like, God, it baffles me. Like, you know, I see how exhausted you are. I mean, that was part of why we went to the sanctuary last week was like, I knew I needed to get her out of the house, give her some support. I could be with her all day long and like help with Max because she was so tired and stuff. And I'm like... How does so? First of all, how does a couple do this with no family support? That would be and no nanny and both right? working and both working because right. that's most that's common. Right, right. Like yeah. that, okay, that would already be challenging as fuck. Then imagine uh, not ha- not having the other partner to support you and the amount of work that you'd have to do to carry the load to, for the household financially. And I'm going, yeah, it's this unreal. Is, this is insane. And then I had a moment yesterday when I uh, was I'm heading home from work uh, Mondays. Mondays typically are a little bit longer day uh, for me just because it's Monday and uh, getting caught up from all the weekend stuff. We got a busy week this week because we uh, Sal's traveling next week so that we're doing a little extra work. It's a manic Monday. Right. It, <clears throat> but, you know, uh, again, uh, very blessed. I still get out of work by 530. You know what I'm saying? That's a late day. Yeah, that's a late day. Yeah, no. and, I, and I know better that, like uh, – that is very lucky, right? Most people have to work much later. I've worked much later for most of my life. And I, I'm driving home. I get home, walk in the door about 5.45 or so. And uh, he's already getting ready for the bath. And that's, you know, he bath time, you know, feed, read, and then it's bedtime for him. And so I really, I didn't have a chance to really spend very much time with Max at all. I didn't get any like real dad son time. And then I thought, like, wait a second, like this is just one off night for me, and you know I'm bummed out. I'm like, what? How the fuck does a dad do it who works till seven or eight o'clock at night? Like, doesn't most kids go down like around seven or eight? Don't most most yeah. parents have their kids go down early? They don't see their kids yeah. that much except for weekends. Ma- yeah, maybe weekends. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're a single parent, you, I cannot. All I can imagine is you're probably. Your entire life probably revolves around what you have to do mm-hmm. to, 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 to take care of your kids and maintain that. You have zero time to do anything for yourself. Zero. I have so much compassion. Yeah, and the amount of organization. Could you imagine the, imagine the, 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 the amount of organization and scheduling that you would need to have to it, manage that? It gives me nightmares just thinking about it because that's my weakness. Like organization mm. and time management are like my two... Like that's my Achilles heel. Oh, and yeah. it gets, always been. And it gets as they get older, it gets worse because then they have school events and sports and other things. So then you have to remember all that stuff. And mm-hmm. oh, I need you to take me to soccer Field trips coming up, like like permission slips, this and that. Like yeah, you got to really know what's coming ahead of you. No man, single parents are. I, I I my hat is off to you because that is that is so insanely difficult and challenging. Having a kid is challenging anyway. That's why it's one of the, this is a sad thing to say, but statistically speaking, there are things that uh, cause higher divorce rates and having a child is, is one of the top ones. Yeah, Having a child, if you are in a relationship that isn't strong and yeah. you don't have a great There's friendship- any crack, yeah, it'll expose it. It'll, it'll, it, just, it just applies pressure. Right, you right. know, it's a difficult, difficult thing. But anyway. I also have a bone to pick with you, Justin. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, you know- <laughs> <laughs> probably I don't know the show. How long has Once Upon a Time been out? Probably a year. Uh, oh I, yeah, I avoided watching Once Upon a Time because Justin, you gave it a bad review. Justin reviewed it so shitty, <laughs> and I was like the 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 uh, preview wasn't enough to like really entice me. Other than knowing like the cast, I was like, so hey, obviously you liked it. I really liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you shit on didn't, it hard. Didn't, I, I didn't, didn't like it. Did it win awards? Tons of awards. It did. Yes. Yeah. It won all kinds, of, and that that was what made me kind of go down the path because. I was. I saw. Uh, by the way, I watched Jojo Rabbit too, which was excellent. Oh, that tell me that, that wasn't one. amazing. Come on, that, that was that was really good. Did, right. you, did you get emotional? Yeah, it got me a little bit. It yeah, did, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it mm-hmm. did a little bit. It was just a well, very well written, uh, mm. very gutsy. 
uh, way to write too. Like no, not a lot of people touch that that topic, and they communicated from, it so well from a satire side, right? Yeah. Like well, no, not a lot of people do that. That was well done. Yeah, it was it was very much from the kids' perspective, which made it like lighthearted and everything, and like really tough subject matter from a kids' perspective. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. No, anyway. uh, very intelligently written. But yeah. yeah, I don't know, dude. Maybe it was like a mood I was going in, or the, the I don't even remember who I watched it with. Sometimes that affects like your overall viewing of something. Oh you yeah, know? if you're watching with someone who's not into the yeah. show, like it would definitely like oh. I don't know, maybe that's it. I'm not giving myself excuses. I like just remembered that I was kind of like dozing off and then I would come back in when there was like one action scene and then the rest of it and I love the the actors that were in it. Like, I thought they did a great job. I just wasn't paying attention to the overall theme of it. It just mm. didn't capture me. Well, I'll watch it now. I wasn't going to watch it either cuz of you, Justin, but now that <laughs> I'm serious. Wow, you guys really listen to me. Though. Well, that's yeah. what that says. Well, yeah, okay. we you right. know we trust your. Opinion. Well, I usually do a good job of reviewing, yeah. so maybe that was a miss. I used to trust your opinion. Correction. Uh, well, I'm going to well, test it again. Quentin Tarantino <laughs> is an acquired taste. You have yeah. to like. Well, I like most of his movies. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and you said they won a lot of awards. Yeah. Speaking of which, these this last uh, Academy Award whatever. Yeah. Got the lowest views and ratings that they've had in a very long time. I didn't even know they had one. It broke new records in terms of lows. Really? Yeah. The, the There are articles that are coming out talking about how the era of the celebrity is over. Um, and I think Finally. It's, yeah, I know. And you know what I think it you is? You know what's funny, though? What do you want to bet we see the same thing emerge for social media stars? Oh, from YouTube. Oh, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So, yeah, none of them want to, and that's the thing is, it actually costs them money to jump onto TV shows and to movies, and like none of like your Logan Pauls want to do that. Yeah, yeah, they make way more money just staying on their YouTube. Own, you're exactly their own network. No, one of the biggest gripes is uh, is the when they go up there to accept their award, and then they preach to everybody, but they're oh god, but there's they, there's such. I mean, and remember, they're actors, so they're really good at making you believe in what they're saying and that they're likable. But they are hammering us about, you know, from a bubble. You know, do you know that they all had gift bags that were worth over twenty five thousand dollars with the stuff that was inside? Yeah, that's you like usually a, do that. Like right? a twelve, yeah, like a twelve day cruise on a private ship. That's what gets and, them to show up. And they and they and then when they talk up there and they lecture us about whatever climate change while they flew in on private jets or yeah. lecture us about how we need to. You know, better equality. That's Meanwhile, why Ricky all- Gervais was just so yes. amazing. I love that guy. And and he yes, and I think he gave he he probably would have would have helped them. So yeah. it was a twenty percent drop. Huge, dude. Yeah, 20, so this, 20, I saw something. Number. I saw something with uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Like he's been on a roll lately with lecturing uh, the world about things. Yes, dude. Just act. Yeah, you're good at acting. Just act. Like I don't want to go watch a baseball game that's done by the world's top tech CEOs. I care less about your baseball skills. You're awesome at tech. Why don't you stick to that? You're an actor. Just keep acting. I don't want to hear your opinion. I feel like it's like just this. We see it even in social media. There's examples of it of people that get start off um, relatively small on Instagram, then blow up and blow up on YouTube. It seems like the the natural progress. And I really think it's for advertising and marketing purposes. Mm is to pivot into the political side. We see this with like the Elliot Holses, you yeah, see this right. with the Hodge twins, you see this who else are we who else are we following that we've talked about? Yeah, but before? rarely does that make somebody who's already massively famous more successful. Oh, see, I disagree. Usually it hurts them. I disagree. You think so? Yeah, it looks like it it hurts them because it it definitely turns off a large portion of the audience, but because they take a stand, I mean shit, this is what our marketing guy is always trying to tell us. Yeah. You know, I wish Be more you, divisive. Yeah, if yeah. more divisive and be, by taking a stand politically, that's a real easy one. You're left or right. I mean, there's a yeah. few people that are liberal, I mean, a libertarian, but for the most part, you're left or right. So taking a hard stand and drawing a line in the sand and taking yeah, a side. Yeah, but if you're already huge, like if you're famous, like, you know, Lady Gaga or Madonna, and then you come out and you become divisive. Well, look what, no, look what well, happened with Taylor you, Swift. You get the people that are like really on your side, and then you get the hate follows. You know, so you still win. Yeah, maybe yeah, Taylor I, Swift. Maybe right. Taylor Swift spent. You, have you guys watched that documentary on her right now? No, that's pretty good. The one on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. It's no, pretty I don't good. watch that. Um, Very talented. Yeah, yeah. Extremely, extremely talented. Extremely talented. Her entire career, she avoided talking about politics, and got to a point where she couldn't take it anymore, and she tweeted. And it was like the most viral. It's like I think today it's still the most viral thing wow. ever tweeted. Uh, came from that. So 
you know, she got a lot of hate too, you know, so she's got tons of hate now from See, it, but it only blows you up in the grand scheme of like the world. Because maybe. there's a ton of people that may not be a fan of her music, but for sure every person is either leans more conservative or leans more what liberal. What did she tweet? I, I missed it. Oh, I don't even remember what the tweet was. It was it was a fucking, she was taking a stand on, um, oh, you know what, her state that she's from, the 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 person in office was trying to take rights away. I, I don't want to say take rights because it's not it's not the the right words for it. But it, she didn't agree with uh, the policy. The person was hardcore conservative, uh -huh. uh, and the policies that they are trying to put in place uh, I, for as far as gay rights and as far as abortion. I'm assuming yes. Okay. Yes, abortion okay. and and something else. I can't remember what it was. Interesting. Yeah, and so she she vocalized it. Yeah. She well, said see, something. Back in the day, celebrities were encouraged to not ever bring up things like religion or or politics but i think now because celebrities have such a close connection to their audiences through social media it's becoming more and more of a thing and maybe you're right adam maybe because they're not seeing a huge backlash that more of more of them feel emboldened to come out and say something well it gets, I don't a, know. It gets some more attention it, it but, does. but it is true that they are getting less and less powerful like their influence is becoming smaller and smaller um, in terms of getting people to act in particular ways. And yeah. these see, award ceremonies are a bit of a, a reflection that's why, of that. That's why I think we're going to see a change Absolutely. in the guard because I think people on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook are ga gaining more power and more attention and mm -hmm. authority in in these in this this side of the, you know, in politics. And the it's the, the people that are famous on television and movies are losing that because yeah. you can't connect with them the same way. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm, I'm a, a big Robert De Niro, Al Pacino fan, but honestly, I don't know any of their political views really because mm -hmm. they're, they're so untouchable. They're on the movie screen. Like I know how they act. Like I don't know much about their personal life. I don't follow any of them on social media because they probably either they don't do it very much or they're not into it or I don't give a shit enough to fall in that way. But if you have somebody who you've been following on Instagram – and you've watched them go from zero to millions of mm. followers, and you've followed that entire journey. Yeah. You have this connection in that bond with that person, the same thing, the connection that we build with our audience. Well, plus, they're playing the same old game of like you have to say certain things because your producers and you know executive producers and everybody else up the chain is going to fire you if you you know go off of the script, mm. you know, and do things that are like. And these platforms we have now, you can just be a human being and say what's on your mind, and so. It's like it's a completely different uh, animal that's out there now, and it's set free. Yeah, and you're you're right about the like it might affect their job. Sometimes I think they say what they think they're supposed to say so that they continue to work. 100. Um, percent Who was, protect their job? What was the name of that producer that ended up being a total fucking scumbag? But he was like a big. What's his name? Was it Weinstein? Weinstein. Weinstein. Yeah. You know how many people knew about the shit that he was doing and made jokes about it? There's videos if you go on YouTube. Yeah, no, it's, it's you can see clips of. People at award celebrities at awards uh, ceremonies uh, making jokes about it. Like if if Wednesday asks you to go up to his hotel room, make sure you don't or whatever. And they laugh. They knew that this guy was a piece of shit. And nobody called him out. Yeah. Because the dude was so powerful in Hollywood, and doing so was basically uh, suicide. It would kill your career. Right. So he was allowed to to conduct his shitty scumbaggery for a long time yeah. because of it. Well, it's been disrupted now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank goodness yeah, it hasn't. No, it's anyway, a good thing. Dude, I had a, a, a great workout this morning uh, in my garage, and uh, you know, I had some interesting thoughts about the way that people change, uh, have been changing kind of the way that they work out, in particular, what they do in between sets. So uh, every once in a while, I go to a, a commercial gym. I still am a member at one. And I'll go every once in a while, on average, maybe two or three times a month. And one thing that I always notice is most people, or a lot of people, I should say, in between sets of their exercises are doing something on their phone. They're texting or they're on social media. This is kind of a big thing. And it made me think, like, I wonder how important maintaining focus is throughout the whole workout. Because that does break your focus a little bit. Like, in one minute, I'm doing my rows and I'm squeezing and I'm feeling the muscle. And then the next minute I'm checking Instagram or I'm sending a text to my friends. It wasn't like that uh, for a long time. For a long time you worked out and you either had, you had music. Yeah. There was nobody brought a book. It was rare to see somebody bring a book or do something weird in between sets. It was typically, or you're just like pacing around. You're pacing around. And so I thought this and I'm guilty of it, right? I'm guilty of doing this in between sets as well. So today with my workout, I put my phone down in between sets and I noticed that doing so, 
I was way more connected oh, yeah. and focused to the workout. And I think it's understated in terms of how much of an effect that'll have on your workout performance. I, you know, it's kind of, it's weird because I have two, uh, two thoughts on that for me personally, because I, I, I feel the exact same way. When I set my phone down, connect it to the Bluetooth and just ignore it the entire workout, I for sure have a better workout. Then there's the other side of me that the way I work out right now, because I don't have these crazy goals to make major moves and like it's more about getting in and exercising sure. for me. My workouts are, you know, stretched to be an hour and a half, two hours long, very slow, long rest periods. I'll come over, I'll sit down, I'll respond to DMs, I do email. And I I know they're not my best workouts. They're, mm -hmm. they're not at all. They're nowhere near the performance or what I could be getting out of them. At the same time, uh, I'm able to multitask mm -hmm. and do other things. And, and right now I don't have anything that I'm like competitively trying to make moves in my physique. So I think it really just depends on where your mindset is currently and your priorities. Very yeah. fair. Very, yeah. very fair thing to say. Um, I agree with you hundred percent, but I, you know, studies will show that when somebody concentrates, for example, on a muscle, mm -hmm. that that muscle actually activates more. Yeah. Uh, and I don't need a study to show this. I've been training people forever and I've been working oh, yeah. out for a long time. I know that. I know I can do a barbell row and just with my mind, you might not even be able to tell by watching my form unless you're really, really experienced, that I can make it, I can feel it more in my rhomboids or my lats, mm -hmm. or I can feel it more in my traps or my biceps, depending on how I concentrate on the exercise. So that focus, and bodybuilders have known this for a long time, they call it the mind to muscle connection. That focus plays an integral part in how effective your workout is on what muscles you develop or how you develop them. So losing, breaking that concentration every single set, which is what a lot of people do, mm -hmm. has got to have a detrimental effect on the at least your performance. And and if you're really focused on your workout, it's going to be a lot better. Yeah, it's interesting because I've actually noticed, and I'm I'm trying to keep a pulse on what's out there in terms of modalities and you know what sort of education is being promoted now in our space, and I see a lot of tendencies now towards you know the brain and, and to really like focus in on this the, the cognitive boosting ways of training and to be able to really control and focus their body in a certain direction and this really helps to enhance you know uh you know how your brain performs as well and um i actually know a few people that are like developing uh you know these methods and things and kind of pitching them and having me go through uh some of their content and it's really good but it's it is along those lines it's it's we just it's because of the distractibility that we have mm -hmm. today is, right. is, is such the, uh, you know, the barrier now to really get those types of benefits that we used to receive. And we didn't really realize that that was a big component. Yeah. Well, see, like when I did cardio, cardio, I liked it to be distracted because I'm repetitively walking. I'm not moving anywhere. I just want to do my 30 minutes. Now, if I was a competitive endurance athlete, probably don't want to be distracted. I want to focus. I want to make sure my running is perfect. I want to... When I'm lifting weights, if I'm trying to build muscle, connect to the muscle, maximize my form, make sure it's perfect, what I do when I'm not doing the set is important, just like it is when I'm doing the set. Maybe not as important. Of course, you want to be most focused when you're doing it. But in because what happened is I put my phone down, didn't look at it, yeah. and I found I had a way better workout. I yeah. was just – I was in the – I didn't leave the space. My mind didn't leave the space. It's part of why I have a hard time, and I know like I should because uh, anytime I post a video of me working out or throw it up in my story, like it gets by far the, the most views, the most attention, mm -hmm. and for – business reasons i know it would behoove me to do that but the truth is i know it's it fucks my workout up mm -hmm. to walk over mount the phone up hit record do it all just for fucking so i can post it up i i honestly i can't stand that it drives me crazy because it, it it interrupts that process especially if i'm trying to lift heavy yeah especially if i'm trying to get after it like i don't want to hear nothing but my fucking metallica in the background <laughs> yeah. and just be thinking about that bar getting up that's well, all i want to think about. it's interesting we're bringing this up because I, I mean i just got an email today about you know and these guys i've worked with before they're developing apps and one of this app you know like concept that they're developing right now is to be able to slide back and forth between your your podcast and then music and then it like it switches like within your workout so you have your music while you're working out and then when you're resting it goes right back to your to your podcast mm -hmm. oh interesting i thought that was an interesting concept i wonder you know in terms of like now 
they, I, I've talked to a lot of people that listen to our show, that listen to other shows, you know, that are fitness related, that actually do a lot of their consumption of podcasts while, they work know, out. while they're working out. Oh, well, 100%. I mean, okay, so that makes sense. Um, it's a little bit of a distraction, but it's more you're more in the space of working out when you're also listening to... Yeah, you're still consciously thinking about and your workout. Yeah, yeah, and you're talking and people are teaching you about exercise and they're answering questions, especially as you're learning. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Uh, it makes more sense than going on Instagram, reading this article, texting my friend, mm -hmm. where I'm leaving the space of uh, the workout. Because for me at least, uh, you know, because I've been doing this for so long, and I know you guys are the same, workouts to me are sacred. Um, there's something that I do. I don't have to want to build muscle. I don't have to want to burn body fat. It's a very important part mm -hmm. of my day. It's meditative for me. And I think respecting that, I just get the best. I get the best connection and the best, I'm the, same the most out of it yeah. uh, by doing that. But it was crazy because I, I do the same thing. I'm in my garage and I'm, oh, I'm going to do this post. I'm going to do that or whatever. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put my <laughs> phone down. Put it down. And I'm going to be in the workout the yeah. whole time. You know, you, you talking about your workout just reminded me of something I want to announce on the podcast uh, that you did today. Um, and we really haven't put a lot of energy and effort. Uh, into the YouTube. It's kind of, it's been a secondary thought for us business wise. And although we continue to employ people to put content out on that to add value to our community, we really haven't really tried to grow it uh, like aggressively like we have other aspects of the business. And so that's a big focus for 2020. And one of the first things that we want to do and lead this way, like we have with every other part of our business, is to give. And so one of the things that we haven't done on the podcast is to tell our audience here that if you're not subscribed uh, to Mind Pump TV and turn the notifications on, you're going to want to do that because the next video that Sal comes out with, we're going to start doing giveaways uh, within the first you know hour to 24 hours of people that get on there, comment or follow whatever instruction he gives. So we're really trying to put uh, energy and focus in scaling that side of the business up this year. And one of the first ways that we want to do that is by giving away people that are interacting with us on that. So look out for that. That should be coming and, in the next In our YouTube two. channel, we have so many videos because we've been posting between one to five a week now for years that if you have an exercise question or a body part you want to focus on yes. or – Free workouts. There's free workouts, entire yeah. workouts that we videotaped. I'm so glad that you, we recorded and put I'm on. I'm so there. glad you said this because this is um, one of the hardest things now. Is uh, it, it's at a place where I can't. It's impossible to respond to every DM, um, and a lot of times the DMs are something that we've answered or we've already done, especially on the YouTube channel. So what I end up always saying to them is Google Mind Pump TV and then what you're asking me. And you'll see in a right away. A chances video. are it's there. Yeah, chances yeah. are that. Yeah. So before you reach out to us in our DMs, and 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 this is just I'm 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 asking like I'm um, please do this. It just it helps us help more people. So that's where I'm coming from here. Yeah. yeah. Is because when I have 20 DMs that get flooded in there, and they're all asking questions of if if you would have just went to Mind Pump TV and literally typed in that you would have got an in incredible eight to twelve minute video giving you your answer. And uh, you you want me to go link it for you and do that for you? I I didn't have a problem doing that when we had uh, very little people that mm -hmm. were DMing us, but it's got to a point where I can't even reach everybody anymore. So one of the things that you guys can do to help support us to support our community is before you DM or before you ask one of us a questions like that, first please go utilize the free resources that we've created and we spend money on to give value to the community, which is the YouTube channel, the blogs. You have a, you can subscribe to the blogs on the website, which we've got three. We're about, just so you guys know, you guys don't even know this. We're about to start ramping up to nine fucking blogs a week. Mm -hmm. Like we're putting out tons of free content. All you have to do is go on there and search for a topic you want to learn about. And we've probably spent the time and money yeah. putting in a really good video or a really, really good it's, article. It's an information uh, battle. It's a war on information and there's a lot of bad information in the yeah. fitness space. We're trying to crowd it out with good information yeah. as much as possible. Speaking of DMs and all that stuff, uh, I read an article today about one of the latest wellness influencer trends. And- just when you thought that they couldn't do 
I thought they're cracking down on the bullshit. What's happening? Oh, no. Are you kidding me? The butthole sunning was just the last one. Oh, bro. <laughs> okay, yeah. so butthole. It, that had, I feel like that was a trolling move, though. I don't, I don't see no, a lot of no, truth it's, in that it's one. It's growing, it's, bro. I mean, I brought it up a bunch of times. I just thought it was funny. Dude, what's his name? Bulletproof. What's his name? Dave Asprey did it, remember? He did, He posted on Instagram. Get right? the fuck He shined here. his butthole to the sun. And, uh, anyway. So, okay. Of course he did. Okay. Ridiculous, silly, stupid, not totally dangerous. Sure, you could get a sunburn on your butthole. Ooh, and, yeah, that would suck. Yeah, but that's not going to kill you. That's not going to This good. next one is a terrible thing, and they're actually promoting it. So, there are people on social media with lots of followers right now who have sworn off. You ready for this? Water. They are now- Stop, no, dude. Swear to God. What? They're not drinking any water. They're saying they get all their hydration by eating their water through things like fruit. So yeah, I don't drink any water. I just eat fruit and like stuff like watermelon. And I have what all could the, possibly go wrong? Yeah, it's like dry fasting they call it, uh, and and it's uh, hilarious. It's so funny. It's you know it's funny. You look at the pictures of them, and you can tell. I want to know people who like, like starts these things. You know, it's like because you you see it just pop up, and it's usually because at least you know ten or twelve or so like influencer people like bought into this bullshit. This drives me crazy. It's just too be, much. Just because you can does not mean you should. Yeah, and you know what's well, someone's gonna die, and yeah. then and then we're gonna and then yeah. we're not gonna hear about that they died. Even if they don't, even if someone doesn't <laughs> die from it, again, if just because we can, Darwin just because our our bodies are unbelievably resilient. And badass. Yeah, if you get enough fluid through your food, you might be okay, but you ain't gonna be hydrated yeah. very well. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not ideal. Yeah, no. it, it's it's. You know what it is? Here's another part of it. A so lot of stupid, times, dude. these influencers lie, so they'll say to you th like uh, like, "Oh, I'm a vegan." Here, this was actually a big deal for a second. Uh, you had these vegan influencers who got caught by fans who saw them in public eating like fish or eggs, burgers, and they'll film it and then post it, and then the person has to come on and apologize. Oh, oh you know. I yeah. I was, I was hungry. Yeah. Oh, I made a mistake. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Yeah. Massive, yeah. massive bullshit. <laughs> oh, it's man. crazy. It's such bullshit. Dude, you, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, did you guys, you guys are big fans of Pixar like me, right? Yes. 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 Oh my God. So the last movie I saw that had a big impact was Inside Out. Did any of you watch that movie? Oh, I love that. It was so uh, accurate. Like such an audacious idea to tackle like the human emotion and yeah. like portray it in the way they did. It was good. Well, dude, I just saw a, another like, trailer so they're 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 on it again let's tackle the soul let's let, let's do, let's tackle the afterlife like oh wow. like what like that's crazy what's it called it's called soul oh wow so yeah. it's about what happens to you after you die yeah this guy like i guess he falls into like a sewer and then uh, they, they portray his soul as being this sort of blue little you know like ghostly looking thing and then it like travels to the afterlife and that's really all we got so far but i'm just like so intrigued by that company and their like how they write story and like how like it just reminds me of back when when Disney was like all about you know the the, the story of everything and like mm -hmm. how they could like portray like major topics that or or a better example would be uh, Mr. Rogers how he would like you know bring up like like think like war and like heavy topics yeah. with with kids and like be able to show them like how to deal with that. Now so, does Disney not own Pixar? Yeah, yeah, okay. they own okay. it. Okay. So yeah. speaking of of Mr. Rogers, did you guys actually see the film that Mr. the Mr. Rogers story? Oh, the one with, oh, with Tom, Tom Hanks uh, or Tom Hanks? the other one? Yes, with Tom yeah. Hanks. I did watch it. Oh, you did. I didn't yeah, see yeah. that one yet. So you know that's a, that's a, that's an actual story. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why I said. So I I didn't I wasn't in a hurry to watch it because I already watched both. Yeah, I loved the first one. I so. watched the two, I, there's two documentaries out on. Yeah, on, this is an actual. Uh, it's an actual dramatization. It is really good. It's not bad. It's because yeah. you you already know the story because you've watched the documentary, but this actually tells it from a perspective of somebody who was supposed to interview him back then. A reporter. Super oh. super cynical reporter too. Really? Somebody who was just like, oh, this guy, mm -hmm. and he's like known for like writing was really it negative. Esquire, was it Esquire magazine? Or? I forget what okay. magazine it was, but the, the, the if you, because like I always go down the rabbit hole after I like get into, like is it a true story and who was the, the writer and he was really well known and known for like just tearing into people hmm. like ripping apart people that present themselves as these holy holy or great people and like so they literally put him on this and you get to hear his whole experience with him it's so good and hmm. for, i mean tom hanks is amazing yeah and mr you know that mr rogers documentary i said was probably one of my all-time favorite documentaries. so good yeah, yeah such a powerful so good it was really good so um yeah. some cool science uh news that's coming out so there's this signal that we're receiving from space on a very consistent basis. Maybe, Doug, you can look this up. I think it's like every 
16 days from the Sirius uh, star. It's, I don't remember where it's coming from, but it's a space signal that is extremely consistent. It's like every there's a lot of period of time it comes every time and we know it's coming from a galaxy that is probably extinct or long gone because it's traveled millions of series. A mysterious what? radio signal from space is repeating every 16 days. What? And we have no idea what where it's trip. coming from or what? whatever. Is and it? it's accurate. Every 16 days it's coming to us. What and it's just like blips that are like continuous. Like how does what, what kind of signal it, is it? It's they they deciphered it. Said beware. It's no, stop it. No, <laughs> it's just some signal. I'm not, <laughs> we're coming. We're, we're coming. coming. Ah! Patting down the hatches. Yeah. So it's kind of cool, right? That we're getting this weird radio signal. I mean, it Dude. could it could be a na- obviously it could be a natural phenomena. Yeah. But um, the fact that, that it's, it's every 16 days. I was going to say they've timed it every 16 days. Yeah. That's trippy. Isn't that weird? Yeah. It, was that signals or what, uh, signs or I, uh, I, I that, forget what movie it was. What was her they, name? Jodie Foster? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. They were trying like forever. Like scientists have been hoping for something and they haven't gotten any sort of signal. Oh, so this dude. is uh, actually a big deal. Oh, I've been meaning to ask you, Justin. How was your, your class? Uh, you just had one this week. Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. You didn't give us a, the yeah. I love We missed one in between too. Yeah. Yeah, no, so it's it, it was actually kind of funny because uh, this time we we did uh, pantomiming, which you know like, now what's pantomiming again? So you know like a mime, it's like charades, like, right? Like you're I'm, I'm in a box, you mm-hmm. know, or this is a wall. Uh, so you, basically, like you you have to act these things out with your body, and it's not about like how you say it, right? Oh, so okay. in a sense, so we did all these like really uncomfortably weird uh, like activities together, and and, and uh, <laughs> that was probably one of the one of the more like uh, alien sort of a things for me to experience because I was like, I just don't. I don't do. I mean, I have what gestures. You, what'd you get? Uh, well, so basically, like, what you have to do, like, in one of these drills, is like you have to like have a pretend ball of clay, and so in this ball of clay um, is is passed to you from somebody else who created something out of it. So let's say like they molded something and they're they're like pantomiming this whole thing that they're they're making, and now you have to receive whatever they gave oh you, God. and then like act out what it is. And then if and then if you don't do it right, they have to like you know figure out how to make it more presentable where you understand what they're oh, doing. Oh, that's interesting. Which is really cool, like you know on paper, but you know in in reality, I'm just like, I was like, what are you doing? Like, because some people are good at it, some people are just like dog shit, you know. And yeah. it's like, I had a guy that was kind of dog shit, like right next to me, like trying to like come up with something. <laughs> he's <laughs> he was, listening. He was, yeah, he probably is. Uh, but it, it was it was like a corkscrew, and so he's like trying to like pantomime this whole thing, and I'm like. Uh, I wasn't getting it. He was trying to pantomime a corkscrew. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! I would see. I would be so tempted to do some inappropriate shit yeah, like with a, some clay. A I know. I yeah. would so do a dick, dude. Yeah. That's me. And then you hand it to somebody. Yeah. Here you go. <laughs> I, I've like I've like ticks towards that. You know, yeah. it's like I've been I've already been like like not not like totally focused, but I've been called out a few times about like you know trying to go for the cheap laugh or you know like or this or that or like we had okay here's an awkward one for you guys. Uh, so we had like a room full of people that we all have poles. Okay, and then first thing the instructor's like, okay, it's not a stripper pole, you know, like just get that out. Oh, of the way. like a pole pole. Yeah, like you, everybody has to have a pole. You create a pole, and this pole's in front of you, and so like it's a specific size, you know, it's bolted into the ground, and so like you have to just you know visualize this, and it, it, it it's basically creating like an object that's invisible that like has its own reality, and so now everybody has to buy into the fact that this pole is this size, it's this this tall and you have to do all this without like telling anybody uh you know, what you're doing mm-hmm. and, and and now you have to like you have to grab on somebody else's pole which i thought was interesting <laughs> like hey sir let me hold your pole <laughs> like this is awkward he's like it's not the first time <laughs> it's, like, it's like okay he's like it's, like, it's a big pole dude handle yourself i'm like all right i got it uh and so you, you go around and you have to have, keep one hand on on your pole and then like so anyway you have to like be able to like agree that this has, you know, some form of reality here, which everybody buys into. And by the end of the time, like, you have to have the same number of pole and they have to be the same size that they used to be. And so we failed like three times. There was one extra pole. There's one less pole. I don't get it. They're all different you have to remember, sizes. Remember, remember, remember each yeah, one. Yeah. So, so I guess to explain it a little bit better, like, like, like let's mine pretend, is smaller. I was right? gonna say, let's pretend the three of us all have these poles. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And start the drill with us. So now what so you have to do is, is you created one. it, right? It's, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's definitely the smaller one. Can you, can you one, talk skinny. to me? Can you tell me? <laughs> no. 
Oh, you can't talk to me. You just no. you just create. Your I'm pole. just holding it, right? Yeah. And now I'm looking at you and sort of like gesturing, like, okay, I'm coming for your pole. I see where where your arms are. Oh, sorry. And I made my pole like this. Yeah, yeah. Of course you did. Yeah. yeah. Look at that. <laughs> <It's laughs> Compensate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's, yeah. Here's yeah. my pole. I get it. Okay. Right? Yeah. Okay. You got this massive pole. Okay. I'm coming in. <laughs> okay. I'm stepping towards you. I'm okay. holding mine still. Okay. Okay. So you're holding your pole while you reach for his pole. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So now somebody behind me might be going for my pole too, and I'm like, all right, you know. So you, you gotta watch from out pole. from the poles from behind. There's some people coming from my pole from behind. Okay. This this is reality here. Okay. Okay. So now they're gonna put their hand on my pole. I'm okay, you got my pole, kind of looking at them like, okay, cool. See, this is fun. This is fun talking about this. Yeah, sure. actually, because it, it was this ridiculous. Okay. And now I'm walking towards Adam's pole. I gotta balance his pole. And then I release. So this person has my pole now. They know exactly how thick it is, how tall it is, all yeah. that. Now I'm going to yours. And now I'm holding your pole. You have to go find somebody else's. Now I'm going to work Sal. your way around the Sal has a very yes. little pole, so I'm going to go to He's his got a pole. Tiny, tiny We're inside pole. my pole. That's Ex how big it is. His pole imploded. <laughs> so you're going to his pole, and, and you work your way around the room. By the end, end of the time, you're you're with somebody else's pole, and you're standing there, and, and you freeze. And now it's like, okay, now the, the instructor goes around and, and, and counts how many poles there are based off of like if you're holding it or not. Sometimes sometimes somebody could be holding two poles because they're like stabilizing and mm. somebody doesn't even have one. Yeah. Mm. So that's where it gets they fucking crazy. They call that crazy. skiing, don't they? It, oh, yeah. It is, it is like skiing. <laughs> oh, my bad. Anyway, so that's that that's an example of uh, uh, what we were doing. Wow. I feel like the, the, the skills you learn from practicing that are, number one, you, you just go with it. Don't be just... Well, Don't be shy, scared, well, go for it. Here's one right away. It, it's a fact. 95% of all communication is not verbal. That's yep. true. It's, so I think yep. it's so 75%. No, it's 95. Is it? Yeah, look it up. So <laughs> I just read this actually. Like really? Two days ago. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I was actually going to write something about this. So it's yeah. 95. 95%. Well, yes. I've always heard 74. What yeah. was revealing to me was the first time, I guess, I, I forgot to mention, you could like, you could say certain like words and cues. Like, and so the, the second time, no communication. And so, yeah, it was that. It's like you realized how much eye contact you're oh, making. 93. And uh, you rounded up. Yeah. Like, like what you're, you, you could totally talk just through your body. Well, it says that the nonverbal component. So, this was a study done by Professor Meherebin. Mehe, Mehe, I don't know. Say, that, that was, yeah. Uh, combined the statistics. I don't know. Yeah, that yeah. was weird. Um, so, they combined the statistical results of two studies and came up with a now, with a famous. 93% uh, of communication is nonverbal. 55% being body language, 38% being tone. Right. Wow. There you go. Isn't that crazy? Well, uh, that makes sense. Right. So it that, does make sense. So it makes sense why you would do so many drills where you guys aren't allowed to talk to each other that you got to learn to use body language, eye contact, and like gestures because yeah. if only fucking 7% is actually verbal, that should be probably a smaller percentage of the time spent. Wow. Yeah, and if you're not real specific and you're more general and vague, people don't, you, you tend to fuck it up, right? Because yeah. like it, you have to know specifically what it is. This is why a robot that's monotone and that, 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 that talks like that would be terrible at communicating. Totally. You would not be able to get all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Ah, very interesting. I had a question uh, in my DMs the other day that reminded me of a chicken or the egg. You know that, you know, the old question, what came first? Yeah. Chicken or the egg? Person asked me, I thought it was a, a very interesting thing to bring up on the podcast. They said, what is more important for building muscle, tension or weight? In other words, the weight that's on the bar or the tension that you feel tension. when you're lifting the weight. Tension. And Well, I mean, they both play with each other, right? More weight adds more tension, but it's the right. tension. I agree with you. Yeah, and the reason why I say that is because there, if you had – Heavy weight, and you had do one or the one without the other, right? So if well, you, you can influence tension without changing the weight yeah. by you know improving Exa your form, exactly slowing your form, and you know. the importance of that. It, I think exceeds the importance of load because even and regardless of what the studies say in this, the the risk factor of just increasing load without having good tension is borderline dangerous. But and you could still possibly do it. We see examples of this. You ever had somebody who try and do a squat that has no tension and control? Oh, they yeah. just drop down they and bounce off the yeah, joints. They, they and, bounce yeah. off and they come back up. Uh, versus somebody who understands how to keep really good tension and they can actually decelerate really controlled. Now, now that being said, weight plays a very big role in tension, right? It's yeah. one of the number one ways you increase tension, and it's very hard to intrinsically create tension, at least enough to really create muscle, lots of muscle growth and strength. I right. could create tension by slowing my rep down, mm -hmm. squeezing my muscles, but if I did air squats, I could concentrate as much as I wanted, as much as I could. 
I would not be able to create the same amount of well, tension it's that funny. weight I, would. I geeked out on all that, and that's why I was like trying to come up with a, the solution for that. You know, with mm. like a stick and all that. But like, it, I mean, just just to to be able to convey, you know, how important it is to be able to prepare your body for load, right? Like, and that's and that's really like in a sense, if I could put it in a nutshell, like 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 you need a specific amount of tension to be able to support your joints and to be able to, uh, you know, like like safely move, uh, you know, heavy objects. Mm -hmm. or, or certain things in space and, and and the force of that obviously it communicates through the cell like so you know adding that external load is going to like uh, your body's going to respond where, yeah, are, where are those questions for our class that's a good question it is right really it wasn't on the, nobody asked it in the quad I just got a dm and that's why i brought it up i thought it would yeah, be that, interesting. That, that, yeah, yeah, that's I, cool i like questions like that you know because it's you know we could go back and forth and I, I bet you if you were to if we were to like dig into the studies you would probably support the load side but i would tell you from well experience, that's just because people don't know how to really create tension and they need that external load. Well, and this also, right. uh, we, I mean, we're we're big advocates of uh, isometric training, and I think it's just fallen out of favor, and it's just not cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. So not a lot of people do it, but there's a tremendous amount of value for it when trying to coach or teach a client. Yeah, I mean, if I have somebody who is absolute, and it, obviously who I'm talking to matters. Some clients have great control, can create tension right away. They've got, they have a, they have better. Uh, mind muscle connection than some people but then we've all trained for sure that's that percentage that they have no control mm -hmm. they just they mm -hmm. you, you show a movement and they're all over the place they need something external to create tension absolutely they, they can't do it by tensing up their own body right they, they just simply it's too can't esoteric do it. it's yeah. too hard for them to imagine yeah yeah oh um I, I wanted to ask you adam we have a certification coming up here at headquarters right another one yeah march march 21st to the 22nd we have jason phillips coming in here. oh that's the okay so there you go Ooh, nutrition yeah. certification certification for coaches who want to do online nutrition coaching. It's going to be here March 21st and 22nd at Mind Pump headquarters. And he's still giving away the thyroid masterclass, which if you were to buy that 600 bucks, right, yeah. he's giving it away for free uh, for all Mind Pump listeners, which is which is really cool. And uh, at the beginning of the episode, uh, in the intro, I give you the link where you can get that. Yeah, well, they're all, he's also doing, uh, out, of the, out of those people that get that, 10 of those will be uh, winners for a $500 NCI gift card that you can apply to any of the other courses, Oh, wow. Too. Yeah, sick. so not only do you get that for free, but then from the people that got the masterclass for free, the thyroid masterclass for free, they'll also be thrown in a pool, and he's going to pick 10 of them out of that mm -hmm. and give them each $500 cards towards any of the other courses. So... Really, really love uh, what NCI and Jason is doing uh, as a partnership with Mind Pump, really hooking up. Oh, our it was audience. great to see the response after he was on, even on the show, like how people like he just had such great information to give, and then he goes into even more depth in these in these seminars and everything. It's totally worth your time. Yeah. All right. First question is from Nick Mag Four. What's the best way to retain muscle mass while decreasing body fat, specifically in terms? of how to alter training and how to split up my diet. You, you know, when it comes to, I, I've been thinking a lot about questions like this, and the goal with resistance training should almost always be to try and build muscle and gain strength. Now, why is that a goal when you're trying to cut? Because one of the inevitable side effects of decreasing body fat is that your body will try to reduce muscle mass to slow down your metabolism to make up for the difference. And one of the best ways to prevent the loss of muscle mass is to train as if you're trying to build. Now, your diet is what will reflect the fat loss goal. So if I eat in a calorie deficit, then I'm going to burn body fat and I'm going to lose the least amount of muscle if I lift weights like I'm trying to build. I think sometimes people think, oh, I'm cutting. Now the way I train is going to be to burn the most amount no. of calories all no. the time. No. And you know they lose that muscle building signal and they end up with muscle loss along with it. I, I like this question because we also get a lot of questions around uh, you know, all of our programs because they're all broken up in three or four phases. And people are always asking me like, you know, how should I diet through this yeah. program? Should I be on a bulk? Should, should I be on a deficit? Should I be on a bulk? Should I be on a cut? I'll tell you how I like to do this with clients. And it all depends on who the where the person is uh, metabolism wise, how how fast is it or how slow is it? on what I'm trying to do nutritionally with them. They're going to follow the program as as planned no matter what. Like like to Sal's point, you're always training to build muscle or retain the most, and that's why programs are phased the way they are because one of the ways you can almost guarantee you're probably going to lose muscle mass is stay on the same program, the same training regimen for six-plus months straight consistently and then go into a hardcore diet and cut 
uh, you want to you're going to lose muscle. It's yeah, just that, the happen. muscle building signal is is lost its luster. Yes, and you're at a calorie deficit. Oh yeah. So one of my a simple answer to this that I love to do is, and I'm about to do this right now. I'm uh, I'm helping out a couple close friends with diet and coaching. They're they're following. Uh, one of them's falling strong, one's falling anabolic. Uh, both are female. I've been trying to uh, re- uh, speed up their metabolism. One of them's about 2,200 calories. The other one's around 2,500 calories. The goal, I'm trying to get them closer to 3,000. And what I'll do is when I when I start to cut from them and reduce calories, I, I also like to time it on a, a, a transition in the phase of the programming. So like right now, one of them is on phase one of strong and you know, technically I could, I could start to cut her calories right now, but I like to do it right when I, I send a, a really different signal to her body on a new phase. Makes sense. So you, you, you want to cut the calories when she's getting the loudest, most effective muscle building signal to yeah. offset. And in my opinion, my, or my theory sense. is that that not only benefits uh, her with building muscle and or retaining muscle at least it also promotes fat burning because sure. she's getting this unique signal now or different you know the novelty side of it because she's been in a phase for three or four weeks in phase one and now boom all of a sudden she's seeing new rep ranges new exercises body's going oh wow try and build muscle adapt oh my god we're not getting calories too so it's burning like crazy so even though it's kind of a competing signal it i I find a lot of value. This is how I used to train myself for shows is I always made moves in my diet when I was also making transitions in the phases to, to promote the greatest change. That's really mm. smart, Adam. I've never uh, I've never thought of doing that, but that makes absolute, that makes perfect mm-hmm. sense. I'll even also make uh, intentionally bump their protein a little bit. So I'll, I'll cut calories, but then I'll also... Uh, elevate their protein because most of my my girls I like running or you know you know off like the 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 range. When we cut, I'll normally bump them through like to the more like the one to 1.25 range of protein, but I'm also reducing calories and changing the protein. No, that and that's the second part. Is the other thing you can do is eat a high protein diet and push the upper limit of what is uh, beneficial. And studies show what you you heard Adam. Referring to some numbers, studies show about 0.6 to 1 gram of, of protein per pound of body weight is where you're going to reap the benefits of a high-protein diet. Any more than that, you typically don't, don't reap any additional benefits. But when your calories are low, a higher-protein diet is actually more important. You actually can get away with lower protein when you're at a calorie surplus. This is because the excess calories are protein-sparing. The so body stops reaching for protein for energy. It's got plenty of calories from carbs and from fats. And it's not as important. So if I'm in a bulk, believe it or not, high protein is important. But if I'm in a bulk, it's less important than if I'm in a cut. When I'm in a cut and my calories are low, mm-hmm. that's when it makes the most sense to push the upper limit of the you know beneficial effects of protein. And studies show consistently that that preserves the most muscle. They also show... Uh, that they also help burn the most body fat, probably through the indirect effect of maintaining a faster metabolism. So when you're trying to get cut, whether you're trying to get cut or bulk up, resistance training should be geared around building muscle. It'll give you the best results either way. Also consider this, resistance training, like any tool, is very good at what it's designed for and is eh, it's kind of good for other stuff, but it's really good for what it's designed for. Resistance training, can you build lots of stamina and endurance with it? Yes. Can you get super flexible with it? Yes. Uh, but it's best for building muscle. Nothing. There's no modality that exists that builds muscle as, as effectively as resistance training. So when you do the resistance training, do it, use it uh, the way it's best used, which is build muscle. And that's regardless of whether or not you're trying to burn body fat or gain weight. All right. Next question is from Taylor Dinkle. What are your thoughts on powerlifting for aesthetics? Oh, this is similar to a question that I had. Someone asked me of what I thought uh, is a better place to start, hmm. either bodybuilding or powerlifting. Mm. And my response to them is, I actually said I would lean towards powerlifting uh, first as a base. But I could, yes, as a base. But I could also make the case for the other way. Yeah. So there's I, this is this is not a. Uh, you know, for sure one way or the other. I think there's value of somebody training for aesthetics or the mind-muscle connection, bodybuilding technique of training that is extremely valuable on, from that perspective uh, and what that mm. benefits. Then there's a ton of value for somebody who's to build a really solid foundation, like from powerlifting and what you get from that. Yeah, let's say somebody is like completely brand new to working out. Like, uh, would you guys prefer them to start in a powerlifting 
uh, routine versus a bodybuilding routine. Yeah. Now you're not talking about uh, competitive powerlifting, right? You're talking about no, powerlifting. No, no, no. Yeah, right. yeah. Just I, training he, like just, a powerlifter. Here's just stretching why, your capacity. Here's yeah. why I would lean, believe it or not, more towards powerlifting. Um, and now this is granted the person that we're working with right, is free gonna, of major exa- muscle imbalance. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because I'm going to challenge take all that out because yeah. I can challenge either way. Right. But let's say easily. somebody's free of major muscle imbalance. Because if that's the case, you have to focus on corrective exercise regardless of where yeah. we're going to go. Which follows falls in the aesthetic bodybuilding. It might be right more. Yeah. Yeah, I'd probably go bodybuilding if if there was issues. Right. But let's say everything's fine and they don't have major muscle imbalances. Here's why I'll make the argument for powerlifting because powerlifting is so movement focused. They're more likely to learn biomechanically sound squatting, deadlifting, uh, and bench pressing. You know the mm-hmm. core lifts and movements. Later on, once they've really got good at those lifts yeah. and they can do them well and they know how to maximize leverage and do it in a way to where they don't hurt themselves because that's what powerlifters do. Mm-hmm. They they maximize leverage and efficiency so they can lift the most weight, which means, believe it or not, reducing risk of injury. A powerlifter benches in the safest way possible that can lift the most amount of weight. Bodybuilders don't do this. Bodybuilders lift to feel it in the muscle. Now, powerlifters tend to hurt themselves more, but it's not because of the way they lift. It more, has more to do with the fact that they're always maxing out and pushing their limits. But it'll teach sound technique and form and movement. Then from there, when they have that base, then I can say, okay, focus on your glutes, focus on your quads, focus on your lats, and do those kinds of well, things. Not to- yeah, if, if, if like, say, we're, we're taking this out, like, if nobody has, like, these pre-existing conditions, like, going into it, like, otherwise, I would probably lean more towards bodybuilding because now we can isolate and get a better recruitment, like, joint by joint. But I've found in my experience in coaching people that, you know, if I were to train the movement like you're talking about, uh, you know, like taking them from there to bodybuilding was was a better transition yeah. versus the opposite, where now like taking a bodybuilder and trying to teach them like overall, you know, gross motor movements like was challenging because they, like certain parts of their like joints want to kick in like individually and they're gonna they're Dude, gonna like pull well, like a deadlift with their biceps. Well, now now ima- imagine we have somebody because we, we're also like there's there's so many different. Road. There's so many ways to skin a cat. Sure. Right? Yeah. Just, but let's pretend I've got, we've got a listener who has got you know years of experience, three, five, two, more than two years of experience lifting. So they're not they're not brand spanking new. They see all the maps programs. They see there's a powerlifting program. They see there's a, a maps aesthetics. They, so they're like, okay, where would I start? What would I do? You know, do you think that your powerlifting program is good for sense? So here's if I had a year with you, app powerlifting for sure would make its way into that training. Right. Mm-hmm. So I would for sure use our maps aesthetic, our maps split program, and our maps powerlifting program, mm-hmm. and probably even strong. Like those four, I would use for this person. If you came to me, you said, I, I want to build the most aesthetic physique you've got me for one year, Adam. I'm going to use all four of those programs because there's going to be massive carryover for your, your overall goal. Totally. Now, yeah. if we're, now, the question is about aesthetics. Okay. Now, again, it depends who I'm talking to. If I'm talking mm-hmm. to the person that's been powerlifting for a while, Bodybuilding is going to give them better aesthetics. If I'm talking to the person who is a relative beginner, free of imbalances, they're going to get great aesthetics from powerlifting. Focusing on the movement is going to give them the most muscle mass gains, general muscle building. Now, bodybuilding, the strength of bodybuilding is they can isolate muscles and focus and sculpt on different parts of my body. The strengths in powerlifting are I get really good at these gross motor movements that work everything anyway. So when it comes to aesthetics, it really depends who I'm talking it to. It does, because here's another yeah. person, myself, okay? Powerlifting uh, contributed to my pro physique more than bodybuilding training oh, did. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. I trained like a bodybuilder most of my life. I always wanted aesthetics, and so I neglected powerlifting as I just never identify with, oh, I don't need to deadlift fucking my max. I don't need to do squatting for my max. Like I never drop below five reps. It wasn't until I started powerlifting – did I my physique grow to the next level? So I would even say somebody who is like me, who has always done all the cable exercises, machine exercises, isolation stuff, bodybuilding type of movements for most of their life or most of their training career, absolutely would uh, benefit yeah. extremely from powerlifting for their aesthetics. It's it's what m- grew my back. It's what grew my legs. It bulked my shoulders. Like those things, it put on a lot more mass onto my physique and then when I peeled down it was very obvious that that served my body. You know where you know where powerlifting works phenomenally for aesthetics it, it, and typically for me I saw it be super effective with my female clients who were very body focused. Mm-hmm. The ones who are very aesthetic focused 
who'd been going to the gym for a while and it's all about, you know, I got to change how I look. I got to change how I look. They watch the scale, watch the scale. I'd switch them to powerlifting because I knew that it would get them to focus on performance. I knew it would get them to focus on how strong they were. I knew it got them to move away from the small isolation movements where I got to feel every little muscle. And I'm like, no, 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 forget all that. We're going to get you really strong at some of these core lifts. And they would get these phenomenal aesthetic gains. They'd come to me and be like, oh my God, my butt never looked bigger and better. My hamstrings look round. I have better posture. Then we would go back to the body sculpting, bodybuilding routines, and they would get better results. 100%. If you have somebody who is, and you know, that's another great example. If you are a superset chaser, 15 to 20 reps, low rest period person training, uh, and lots of you know, plyometric stuff, and that's the stuff you love, and you're also trying to sculpt this, you know, aesthetic physique, switch, switching your mindset over to a powerlifting type of routine is going to build incredible amounts of muscle on you. Mm -hmm. So this is a depends question as always, uh, but it really, it, it, who I'm talking to would be where I would push this person, but absolutely powerlifting could uh, benefit aesthetics tremendously. Next question is from Cameron Stewart, 18. What are the top three to five things that the average American can do to improve their long-term health? Oh, great question. So mm. I'll list what I think is is number one. And the reason why I think it's number one is when I, when I think of all the things that a person can do to positively affect their health, when I think of the average person, I think of what will give me the most bang for buck. Like okay. what's the one step that someone can take that's going to make the biggest general impact. Not perfect, because it's only one step. There's more, a big bang. There's more steps, but what's the one thing that, that the average American can do that will really positively give them the biggest positive impact? And if we look at the average American and we look at the health problems, the, the vast majority of our health problems, our chronic health problems, are related to obesity and the overconsumption of food. That's number one. It really is. And you know, even high sugar, high carb, high fat, the wrong foods... When you throw that on top of a lot of calories, they become catastrophic. So the number one thing, and if it's because it's one thing, it can only make it one thing. So I'm not going to say diet because that's a lot of things, right? right I'll say right. one thing. Avoid heavily processed foods. Yeah. That's it. I've got three right away, well, yeah. and that's okay, number go one. I've yeah, got yeah, three yeah. right away that come to mind. Number one, 100%, I agree with you, processed foods. Yeah, because that, that drops your calories by a, five to 600 calories it every is day. A, it's, a simp it's a simple and it's not simple in, in what it takes discipline wise. It's simple as in what it what it takes to follow. It's yeah, just, just like, that's it. Yeah, just get rid of it. Like eat whole foods. If you're hungry, eat whole foods. Not trying to tell you to count, not trying to tell you pay, pay attention to macros, none of that shit. Just literally eliminate processed foods. That single thing I think is the best thing you do. The second thing I, I would say is actually creating good habits and behaviors around movement. And it could be as simple, it could be as simple as this add a 10 to 20 minute walk to meals. Every time you eat, that you just make a habit of you don't sit on your ass for the next 45 minutes. You just, And it doesn't need to be hour. It'd be great if it's 45 minutes or an hour, but make the habit of going for 10 to 20 minute walk right after That's you eat. That's called ritualizing activity. Right. And it's mm -hmm. 100, you're 100% right. Now, you might be thinking, God, a 10 minute walk? Aren't you guys trainers? Don't you guys teach people resistance training, all that stuff? Yes, that would be great. That's actually the best possible thing you could do. But again, just like I said with eliminating processed foods, you ritualize some activity, the odds that you're, you're consistent, the odds that you can fit in your day, uh, and the impact it'll have because of that. Remember that. Impact doesn't necessarily mean the best thing. Impact has to take into account what will people actually do? How many right. people will this work for? And what you just said makes perfect sense. Ritualize yeah. a little bit of activity. This one isn't really fitness related. It's more like community related. And I think that based off that study that you had told us a while back about like relationships and like mm. how that plays into a factor with your long-term health. And you see this in the blue zones and you see this with we're social creatures. We're social animals. And I think that we've all gone way beyond that. And we think that we're being social by being on our phones and talking to people people through social media and through all these things. We don't have any meaningful interactions with other human beings. And I think if, if you were to like kind of uh, definitely work on that and like work on giving, you know, more of yourself into your community, making friendships, making relationships with people, like in terms of long-term health, it have a massive impact. Statistically speaking, you're a hundred percent right, Justin. Having good relationships is uh, paramount. In fact, having bad relationships 
is equivalent to smoking, I think, something like 15 yeah. cigarettes every single think day. think of the stress it causes. It's That's crazy. Right. You, I didn't even think that, and you went to that point, and the reason why I knew the 95% communication thing was because what I was going to write about was exactly this topic is if the average person is claiming that they're spending four to four to five hours on social media every day, 95% of communication is nonverbal and actually physical right in front of somebody. How much are our social communication skills degrading as Americans right now by being- Why do you think there's so much conflict? So right. that's why we have emojis and all kinds of ways to try to make up for the difference. Right. But it just, it just doesn't. It just doesn't. Absolutely doesn't. And, right. st- and studies will, will so, prove this. And in, in, in regards to the relationships- you know, it's funny, I, I, Jessica and I like to walk around the neighborhood um, and we'll do this like 30 minute loop. Mm-hmm. And uh, we ran into an old friend of mine, this guy that I, way back when I first opened my, my personal training studio when I was 23, I think, I trained this guy for a second. Great guy, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Lost contact, but I still remembered him and you know thought about him. Ran into him, he lives in our neighborhood. So we start talking, he's got kids and we're like, you know, after we leave, you know, Jessica and I like, we should have them over for dinner. Now we didn't. Now you know why we didn't? Because why most people don't. You think about all the time, the energy, we got to organize. Yeah. But you know, we, we talked about it and I said, you know what? That prevents so many of us from not having these relationships. But the reality is every time we do it, I've never, I'm almost never. You never regret it. No, I've invited people. Yes, it's a lot of work and all that stuff. But then when they leave, I'm like, you know, that was a meaningful yeah. Four hour, you know, conversation. It made me think of it because I've been coaching and putting myself out there a little bit more and like interacting with other parents and kids. And, uh, you know, I just forgot how much of an impact that made, you know, even on myself, mm-hmm. not, not not to mention, you know, everybody else that that, that we're starting to connect with more. So, right. so I, I had three that came to mind right away. One was not what you just said, Justin, but I 100% agree that if we're going three to five, that has to be in one of those right there. The other one that, uh, I think is extremely important and extremely overlooked is building some sort, and I think it's getting worse, uh, so this becomes more important, is building some sort of night ritual the same way you have a morning ritual. Oh, and, yeah. and I like saying it like that versus telling you something specific to exactly do because every individ- everyone's mm-hmm. going to have an individual variance just like we have with our morning routines. But the, the, the one single thing you can do that will impact it is just make it a priority the same way you do a morning routine. The same way you- You allo- get ready for your day. You, you allot yourself mm-hmm. a certain amount of time to shower. You allot yourself a certain amount of time to brush your teeth, to have your breakfast, to make your coffee, to maybe read. I don't know what you do in the morning, but for sure, yeah, poop, whatever, you for sure have somewhat of a routine that you start your day off with, and some routines are probably better than others, but at least having one is is set you up to have a successful day, right? Yeah, you're right, 100%, because we go to bed, we hit the pillow, we expect, oh, I'm going to go to sleep and have great sleep. Right. And lack of quality sleep is very detrimental. To 100%. Health. And and only getting worse with the the phones coming into the bedroom, with the TVs coming into the bedroom, with the laptops being on your lap still, and looking at and the lights, and we talk about this all the time, disrupting sleep. So just having some sort of discipline around how you prepare yourself to sleep, which is one of the most important times uh, of the day, even though you're asleep, uh, as far as your body, hormonally, and longevity-wise, and stress-wise. So that, to me, I think, uh, if you treat that with care- I What think a great list. Think about this. If, if, if the average American dramatically reduced, didn't even count calories or anything, just dramatically reduced heavily processed food consumption, ritualized a little bit of activity- Maybe tying it to yeah. when I wake up or tying it to nutri- to food, like you said, Adam. So all a 10-minute walk after every meal, that's nothing. They prioritize relationships a little bit. Like, okay, I'm going to go out of my way to hang out with people a little bit and talk with them. And then the fourth one you said, just create a ritual so you can prepare yourself for sleep. If they just did those four things, boy, would we uh, that alone would solve a huge chunk of the chronic health problems that we're suffering from right now. Totally. <clears throat> Next question is from Jeremy Longpray. What are the positives and negatives of being a trainer? Do you have any advice that you wish you knew when you first started? Hard to get, hard to get rich. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> it's it's not if you're it's not a money grab. If you're super driven by money and you just want to make a lot of money, which I was. Yeah, get into <laughs> get into finance or investments. Uh, you know, be a, a, a you know, give 
work with money. That's how you're going to make uh, either money. that yeah. or money, you know, right. my defense because I am this person. I was driven first by money before I was the passion to become a personal trainer. But because I was so driven by money and I fell in love with personal training, you figured out a way. I exactly. <laughs> I, yeah. It forced me to be, get better and better at my craft because just being good, uh, being a good trainer, you're not going to get rich at all. And even being great, probably you're not. Uh, I, so it really uh, forced me to continue to reinvent myself, to grow, to learn, to push, to be at a whole other level, to get to that small percent that make it to that kind of revenue. So yeah, yeah, that's that would be a negative, right? A negative would be it's uh, potentially right. Yeah. If you're if you're trying to be it's a, a trainer, struggle in the beginning. If you're trying to be a trainer and you're not passion driven by fitness, you're gonna have a tough time because uh, that's got it. That's what takes you through everything. Mm -hmm. Another here's another negative. Um, it's exhausting. Yep. It's a very exhausting job. Now you might think, well, why? You know, you're not you're not doing construction. You carry the lifting. emotions of other people. Not just that. That's a big part of it. But the other part of it is, let's say you work an eight hour shift. Yeah, you got to split. You got to split. Yeah, very yeah. few trainers work a nine to five. Yeah, not only that, but let me take it a step further. Let's say you work an eight hour shift at an office. You have there's a lot of time in that eight hours where you could take a break. You don't need to talk to anybody. You can relax. You could go on the internet, talk to your friend. If you're training eight clients in a day, first off, like what Adam said, never are they back to back. If you're training eight clients in a day, you're there for 12 hours because mm -hmm. there's always gaps. But number two, you're on all eight hours. There's yeah. no break. Yeah. Client shows up, I'm working. There is no break in between, and that can be really, really exhausting. Yeah. You determine the energy. Yeah. And I think that's what you're getting. It's it, it is like a suck in in a sense where like you got to really like amp yourself up so you can portray the the best version of yourself constantly. Now the now some of the positives are if if you make it this this is why too I um I, right away when I meet like another trainer I ask him like how long you've been doing it and if they've been doing it for beyond five years, I know they've already they're they're probably pretty good at what they do because it's really tough if you're not a good trainer to have made it past five years because. The things that we're talking about, even if you're really good, you're going to struggle with this. Your mm -hmm. schedule is going to be tough. You're going to go through clients you don't like training. You're not going to make a lot of money. And so if you've persevered through that, you've pro you're probably a pretty damn good trainer if you've made five years or longer. But one of the positives are once you do establish yourself and you build a good reputation for what you do and you're known – for being a great trainer and the referrals begin to come in, then you can start to get very picky about who you train. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took me a long time. And you to, get to hang out with cool people. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely got to a point where uh, towards the back half for sure of my, you know, my 20 years is I definitely got really picky with who I trained. And then my clients got really exciting because I couldn't wait to see them because not only was I getting paid good because mm -hmm. I had also moved my rates up by that time. But I was also going to learn something. I always knew I was going to get something from them, like that would continue to. And that is the same thing that is makes us very passionate about the podcasting. Is mm -hmm. you know that's even more accelerating than what training was. Mm -hmm. Training I love because I got some CEO or I've got some author, I've got some brilliant tech person, and I love to communicate between sets and ask questions. And so you know I get this like front row seat to these brilliant minds that I can pick whatever questions I want to ask them because they're on, we're on each other's time. That is extremely yeah. Yeah. valuable. And you develop a, a close relationship because these people see you for one to three undivided attention mm. hours a week for years. So they spend more undivided mm. time with you than they do with most of their family Other members. Other family members, yeah. So you, you actually develop a really close relationship, and it's great when they're successful, smart people. I mean, I, one of the reasons why I love training doctors, I, you guys know I love science and I love medicine and I love health. I would ask them all kinds of insane questions, and because we're friends – they would add, they would talk to me about them and, and they valued the the time as well so it was really cool the other part is this is that there's a lot of jobs that are out there where you don't really feel your value yeah. you don't really feel the meaning behind what you're doing because you're either pushing buttons or you're making a small part of a big product and so you don't necessarily see the impact no. that you that you have in society when you're training people and you're doing a good job and they lose weight, get better shape, they feel no more pain, yeah. their health improves. You see it directly, and so you have this mm. incredible sense of meaning. The reward is right in front of you. Totally. I, I think that, I mean, that's initially what people get into, I think, personal training if they're really passionate about it. They want to impact other people's lives, and you can do that on a one-to-one -one basis, and it's literally right in front of you. And I, I totally agree. I've I had some of the best conversations I've ever had is with some of my you know main clients that I see on a regular basis, and, and I just can't 
can't, you're not going to get that from a regular job because you're not going to be able to go that deep uh, with somebody else because, you know, you're on this, it's like you're on this journey together. You become like, uh, you know, like it, it's, a, it's a deep bond that you share. Well, it, it's for, to Sal's point about the meaning thing uh, of all the professions, uh, it's probably, and it's not the only one, there's plenty of other ones that I think uh, like doctors would say they probably feel similar with this too, is that it reveals your purpose really quick. Like if this was what you were meant to be oh, yeah. doing, like the first time that you do something where you like fundamentally change somebody's life, like somebody came to you, they're, you know, 45 years old, they've struggled with weight loss forever, they're obese, they've tried this diet, they've done this, and you unlock something for that person that like fundamentally changes them forever. Mm -hmm. Oh my, it gets, gets me emotional just talking about it because it reminds me of all those feelings that I've had when I've had a client like this. When you get that, holy shit, does that provide a, a, such a larger purpose in what you're doing? And if you just remember that as a trainer, that that's your true north, yeah. then everything that you do below, before that to lead to that will really help guide you in your career. And that's extremely rewarding. Yeah, it's, it's to me, it's like, it's truth. It's like, it's like, finding truth you know it's like i feel like it's like a, it's deep like that like you're, like you're you're on this journey to find like answers like that if you have one little key for them that's that's a truth that they didn't have before you know mm -hmm. and it's like something that you can help them find and you're like sort of this oracle like you're here here's where it is but you have to find it yourself and the reward in it is that you know they understand it and then they apply it themselves that's the real reward yeah and it's just it's positive it's always it's always positive and it can be with people who are totally different from you you know i've had clients that have completely differing political views and religions and whatever but they're there to get healthy i help them get healthy and the it's incredible um you know some of them i remember phone calls i would get from clients i had one i've told this story before i had an old older client who came in on her day off to tell me she was so excited she was 80 years old she had lost her independence her daughter came in and hired me to train her and after about seven or eight months of training this woman regained her independence and she came into my gym on her off day to tell me that she was able to go grocery shopping for the first time in two years by herself she was able to close the trunk of her car all by herself and she made the trip to come into my gym walked in gave me a hug and said i i'm independent again because of the training that you've given me and that right there was worth it's worth more than money to me it was worth way more than money it's what kept me a personal trainer for a long time mm -hmm. uh, believe me i had clients offer me jobs and wanted to pay me more and i was like you know i need to feel like i have some meaning behind what i do you know not to end this on a negative note but uh, oh, so positive <laughs> crap, crap, you get, yeah, I know we were all like getting emotional and positive. I'm going to crap you out for a second, but it, it just reminded me of something that, uh, really bothers me. And it, it, and it was something that I spoke to a lot as a, as a, a leader of trainers for many, many years is the, the scarcity mindset. And if you really understand your purpose of, of, of helping and serving people and you've, you've fallen in love with personal training and you claim that you love it so much and that, that is your purpose and what you're doing and you're listening, you're nodding your head and you're like, yes, that's, that's the feeling's amazing and you're a trainer. But then you're also scared to, to direct your people towards information that it could be provided in a better way through them than yourself uh, in fear of losing financial gain. Uh, it, that, that's such a scarcity mindset and will put a ceiling on your cap of how great you become. You know, one of the, the things that made me very successful as a trainer is I, I never feared that because I truly believe that if my true north was that my ultimate goal was to unlock that key for this person is to provide that life-changing feeling or moment for them or forever, you know, change their behaviors. And if everything I was giving towards them wasn't doing that, or even if I was doing things for them, but I knew there was somebody else that could provide even more value for that person, I was okay with potentially losing them as a client to give them the answer answer or to help them better. If you come from that place, it always comes back tenfold. I might have lost hundred percent. I might have lost one hundred and fifty dollars an hour because I sent her over to Doctor Ruscio, who really needs to dive into her gut. And even though I understand that stuff really, really well, and I've read lots of stuff, he's fucking ten times better than I am at that. Even though that I, I lost the one hundred and fifty dollar an hour client, I pass it over to somebody who I think is really going to change that person's life. What ends up happening is two, three years down the road, that person has 
not only talked about the great things that Mike did, but she'll always remember that it was me who sent her over there to help her. I get just as much credit for that. And it may not it directly affect my pocket right then and there, but I always end up getting three, five, ten other people reaching out to me because of that. And you know what's funny? I've never lost a client because of that. Right. It's mm-hmm. never happened to me. No. If anything, they come to me more because I guided them right. in the right direction. As far as advice that I'd have for myself when I first started, I wish Mind Pump existed. I wish because... My personal training knowledge came from certifications, yep. bodybuilding magazines, my own research, and my own experience. If I, if Mind Pump had existed back then, I would have shaved. I mean, you can't ever replace uh, experience, but I would have shaved a good, I don't know, five years off the amount of time it took me to, to go from sucky trainer to oh, not bad trainer. Yeah. You know. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides, resources, and books. They're all totally free. We have a personal trainer guide on there as well, not just exercise and fat loss guides. Uh, We have guides for personal trainers. So again, mindpumpfree.com. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin, me at mindpumpsal, and Adam at mindpumpadam.